I welcome you very warmly to Dumblane Cathedral on this, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Wherever you may be, and wherever, whenever you are able to join us in worship, we're pleased that you have done so. During the course of this service, we shall be celebrating communion, and you are welcome to participate in this by taking some bread and some wine, as we remember the enduring love and presence of Christ, which is neither hindered nor diminished by the restrictions most of us are experiencing at present. This coming Tuesday, the 2nd of February, is Candlemas. And in so-called normal times, we would have been holding a candlelit evening service in Dumblin Cathedral as we celebrate what may well be one of the oldest of Christian festivals, stretching back to the first century of the Christian era. Its roots are to be found in the presentation of the infant Christ in the temple when he was received by Simeon with these words, With my own eyes I have seen your salvation, a light to reveal your will to the Gentiles and bring glory to your people, Israel. The 2nd of February also marks the midpoint between the solstice and the equinox, a point when we begin to become that bit more aware of the gradual lengthening of the days. In our last Candlemas service in 2020, it was observed that a new strain of the coronavirus had now claimed the life of some 300 people worldwide. Last week in the UK, that death toll passed 100,000. A reminder of just how tough and serious this pandemic is. But the days are growing longer. The signs of spring are already with us. A vaccine for COVID-19 is now being rolled out and we may yet acclaim that the light still shines in the darkness and the darkness will not overcome it. Today we continue to pray for all who mourn and all who are ill as a result of COVID-19 and we pray for all who bear authority in challenging times and we pray for patience and persistence in the face of so much. And with the psalmist we declare Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord. Let us worship God, singing hymn 135, O laughing light, O firstborn of creation. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Let us pray. 
gradually, at first almost imperceptibly. The days are lengthening, and there are signs all around that the long winter of fear and of isolation will end. A new day is gradually dawning, and hope and impatience intertwined jostle within our minds. We have cried out to you, our God, how long? We have at times wondered if you have forgotten us. We acknowledge that the journey through these times has been tough and sometimes feels endless. And yet, as the fragile shoots break through the cold, hard earth of winter, hope can still emerge from the frustration of the fear and the dreariness of these days. For all our complaint, doubt and wondering, we still dare to trust that you are with us, as much in the depths of the darkest night as in the bright promise of the new morning, with us in our moments of despair as in our times of most resilient hope. Open our hearts and minds, God of persistence, pre persistent presence, to that light and love that never diminish, to the promises made in Christ that are never withdrawn, and to the resurrection hope that not even death itself can conquer. For as the green blade rises from the buried grain, so Christ is risen from this, the cold confines of the tomb, proclaiming that love, that love lives again and will live eternally. God of resurrection and new beginnings, God of unconquerable love, we worship and we adore you. Yet, we confess that we can find it so easy to be negative in these times, sounding a note of resignation or defeat. We confess that we are quicker to criticise than to encourage. We confess to lingering selfishness and self-pity. We confess that we expect others to do what you call us to do ourselves with you. Reassure us that we are forgiven and that with your Spirit's help we can be renewed, God who can restore within us what has been distorted and mend what is broken. So let us rise up as people with sin forgiven and hope renewed. As in the name of Christ we pray, and as in the words he taught us we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us listen for the word of God as contained in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, and reading from verses 15 to 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. That is what is requested of the, of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet 
shall die. Amen. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, and reading from verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, come out of him, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands, and even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Amen. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. Let us pray. Living God, help us so to hear your word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow your way in all faithfulness. Amen. Although they have become a part of almost every news report, a recent survey revealed that many people do not understand the key words and phrases used by experts and politicians when discussing COVID-19. So if you do not know, 
an antibody from an antigen, you are in the majority. And you and we should only worry about it if you are a health professional. Whilst most people have heard about the R number, fewer than 50% could explain it. And perhaps more surprisingly, words like furlough, variant and asymptomatic were not understood by significant numbers. Now, I don't know who is watching this service, but the likelihood is that some of you have heard what I'm about to say before. Just a little bit of it, though. But for the benefit of newcomers, or just in case you haven't remembered every word I've ever said, let me tell you a little bit about Capernaum, the setting for today's Gospel passage. Capernaum was the centre of Jesus' ministry, and it was a border town. And borders, as we know, are real or artificial lines which separate one area from another or one political entity from another. They are, by definition, always at the edge of something, and they can be indicative of change. In the context of Jesus' ministry, the border town of Capernaum was more than a location. It was also part of the story of change, separating the old from the new, the past understandings from the new reality. But it is not just that Jesus is in Capernaum, but that on the Sabbath day, he goes to the synagogue there. In Jesus' day, the synagogue, as distinct from the temple, was not so much a place of worship as a place of teaching and tradition. There was no sermon, but the scribes, those people who had studied and learned the law and how it should be understood, would read from the Torah and explain to the assembled people how to apply that law to daily life, often restrictively. So we have borders and teaching and tradition. And perhaps you are ahead of me here because when Jesus comes, all three are changed or, depending on your standpoint, threatened. As we look a bit more closely at the scribes, at the man who is healed and the onlookers, each with their different perspectives, let us also be aware of where we are in this account where we are as individuals and as a church, and what that means for our individual and congregational lives. So let's start with the scribes. The Torah contained God's law as given to Moses and was therefore the supreme rule of life and faith. But it did so in general terms. The specific application of those general principles to the complexities of everyday life was not always obvious. And so experts emerged. People who could read and interpret and explain, drawing on precedent, adapting and developing it as circumstances and life changed. Until there was an extraordinary amount of information, all oral, never written, memorised by a select few who were called upon by the general public to apply their learning to an infinite variety of human circumstances. These experts, the scribes, the lawyers, made judgments, enforced the law and explained the reasoning behind their decisions. Case after case, layer after layer, the law developed until it became more and more difficult for anyone other than the experts to know or understand its complexities. And then Jesus arrives. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the carpenter's son. A man with no lineage in Torah, no known expertise in the law. But he began to teach, and he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. 
breaking barriers, removing borders, teaching differently, dispensing with tradition. And the people who heard him were astounded. We can probably understand why the scribes took a scunner to Jesus. He upset their apple cart, their carefully constructed, well-developed and fiercely protected system. And in so doing, he challenged their prestige and their influence. And what of us? Have we created monuments to our own importance, citadels to the sanctity of our own traditions and ways of being or ways of doing church? Here in this splendid building and in the ways we run our affairs or in the national church in its structures and language or in the global church, making it hard for anyone who is not already part of the system to break through and challenge the status quo. And if we have, how open are we to the possibility of change? Change which erases border lines, makes church not just in the sense of buildings accessible to everyone. Change which means letting go of the grasp we have on the traditions of the past to open our hands to embrace the new way, the authoritative way of Jesus Christ. Amanda Gorman is the youth poet laureate whose inspiring words graced the inauguration of President Biden. Her poem called The Hill We Climb contains these words. We lift our gazes not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. They were written about a nation and its people, but are just as apposite to our churches and congregations. But what about the man with the unclean spirit? How do we re relate to him, if at all? Whilst we don't know exactly what the nature of this spirit was, the notion of people being affected by such spirits, sometimes called demons, was almost commonplace in that place and time. The people there weren't troubled either by the demons or the man possessed. What got them animated were the words and actions of Jesus. It's worth noting that to their way of thinking, he was the oddity the one acting strangely and unexpectedly. Generally speaking, spirits, whether benevolent, malevolent or capricious, were more powerful than humans, but less powerful than God. So whilst humans were powerless against those spirits, those same spirits were equally powerless if they encountered God. And Jesus had command over the spirit. The people should have been in no doubt about Jesus' identity or origins, but they seemed unable to put two and two together. Although these spirits could act in various ways, their influence always interfered with a person's interaction with God. It created barriers, caused misguided thinking, and deflected a person's thoughts and actions. So whilst we may not share their understanding of demons and spirits, it doesn't take too much of our imagination to identify things and influences which affect us and our world in similar ways. From a hankering for wealth or possessions, glamour or power, the selfish pursuit of our own ends at the neglect of the common good, the lure of money or alcohol or drugs, and the way they lead to discrimination, poverty, selfishness, and impede or leave no time for our relationship with God. Perhaps we have more in common with this demon-possessed man than we first thought. 
This particular spirit caused him to blurt out a question, what have you to do with us? And an affirmation of Jesus' identity as from Nazareth and also the Holy One of God. In Mark's Gospel, this man or this spirit is the first, apart from God, to identify Jesus. In response, Jesus commands, be silent and come out, which it did. And therein lies a paradox, because with the unclean spirit, this man was on the margins, excluded from normal society in Capernaum, but able to recognise and name Jesus. But in being cured, he can be restored to society. Whilst being silenced, he is no longer able to voice what he knows about Jesus. As an outsider, he had insight. Back in the fold, he loses his individuality. And meantime, Jesus, who began in the midst of the assembly, is moved to the fringes. People in this gathering, both scribes and laity, being not quite sure about him. So where are we? Outsiders on the edge, shouting from the margins because they're vulnerable and desperate. We recognise both our need and the one who offers hope and healing. Our insiders, our voices quieted and our individuality subsumed by the crowd mentality and the need for decorum. No longer able to shout aloud about the new teacher with the new way, the presence and voice of God in our midst. It's a conundrum, isn't it? But perhaps it is inviting us not to be long-winded and verbose like the scribes, but to let our actions do the talking when our voices are stilled. Amanda Gorman again. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. And finally, a word about the onlookers, the others who were in the synagogue that day. We don't know who they were, presumably just the regulars. But what started out as just another regular Sabbath ended up very far from that. They were astounded at Jesus' teaching, for he taught with authority. They were amazed at his command over the unclean spirit, and hence is his divinity. They were awestruck. But unlike the possessed man, they did not name Jesus, either as human or divine or both. Unlike the spirit, they did not obey him. Unlike the disciples we heard about last Sunday, they did not follow him. Instead, they were left with questions. What is this? What is this? And we are told that they kept on asking one another about it, about him and his teaching and the new way and fresh understanding, which is at one and the same time both discouraging and heartening. Discouraging because, faced with the evidence of their own eyes, they were still left wondering, still not able to add it all up and reach the right answer. And heartening because, having found their voices, they did not stop using them. Their silence would have suggested that they were not interested in finding out more, content to go on in the same old way. But asking questions and talking to others suggests a readiness to engage with the situation, to weigh up the evidence, to seek companions along the way, and to enter into an ongoing relationship with Jesus. It's a nice touch to Mark's telling of this story, beginning with the scribes to whom the people turned for answers about their earthly living, and ending with the unanswered questions about the one who offers life in fullness forevermore. 
and it reminds us that we too can struggle with questions about our faith for which there seem to be no answers. Not until we have removed the impediments and barriers, opened ourselves up to the new patterns of faith and life, and entered into relationship with Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. Amen. Let us pray. God, in whom there is no turning nor darkness, but only faithfulness, purity and light. We are glad that, overarching all the twists and turns of human life and governing, the greatest authority rests with you. And that when the time is right, you raise up women and men of courage and faith, who dare to challenge the injustices of this world and the evil of racism in all its forms. As we remember and have remembered those who have perished in Holocaust in recent days, we give thanks for the people of great courage who, in, even in the most hellish of places, served others in the sharing of words of encouragement or of the last scrap of bread or drops of soup. We remember Jane Haining, who refused to abandon the Jewish girls entrusted to her care in Budapest and who perished in Auschwitz. Give courage to all those who, even today, speak truth to those in governments here and all across the world who bear authority and exercise power, that they might do so with integrity and a spirit of respect for all. As this nation learns of the 100,000 and more people who have died having contracted the coronavirus, we remember all those people with respect, acknowledging the gifts, love and humanity of each one of them, and praying for all who mourn the loss of people so precious to them. We pray for all who are ill at this time, and especially for those who are drawing close to the end of this life. Let their departing from this life be a peaceful one, in which they know they are loved and held by the presence and prayers of others. We pray for those who watch and wait with them, struggling to know what to think or say and wondering how they will cope. Guide, strengthen and bless all who care for those who are ill, doctors and nurses and all who work within our hospitals and in community care. God of all life, life upon this earth and life beyond the veil of death. We remember those we have loved and lost, recently or long ago. Help us to trust that in Christ they have found true peace at the last and now rejoice within the great company of heaven where tears and pain are no more. And we remember and pray for those for whom these are tough and testing days as they struggle to find work or as they educate their children at home amidst so many pressures, and as children and students look to the most difficult of years in their education. All our prayers we offer in the name of Christ, and we pray in the words of John Donne, bring us, O Lord God, at our last awakening into the house and gate of heaven, to enter into the gate and dwell in that house where there shall be no more darkness nor dazzling, but one equal light, no noise nor silence, but one equal music, no fears nor hopes, but one equal possession, no ends nor beginnings, but one equal eternity in the habitations of thy glory and dominion, world without end. 
all our prayers we offer in the name of Jesus, to whom all authority in heaven and upon earth is entrusted. Amen. Each year, Dumblain Churches Together organises ecumenical Lent study groups, and we hope to do so again this year, whilst not breaking the, any COVID rules. In other words, we will have to use Zoom or Teams or something similar. We are intending to return to the material pre prepared by Churches Together in Britain and Ireland for 2020, which we began last year but didn't finish. Opening the Scriptures, setting our hearts on fire. If you would like to be involved, please let Dorothy Anderson know. Her contact details are on the website, and an indication of the day and time that would suit you best would be helpful so that we can work out how many groups and hosts we need. Lent starts on the 17th of February, so there is still a little bit of time, but we would, be like, we would like to be able to make plans in the near future and would appreciate hearing from you this week, if possible. Whilst the current lockdown regulations in Scotland still apply, we are, of course, confined to online worship here in Dumbling Cathedral. But we are aware that many people are missing the opportunity to gather, to gather together in the cathedral halls for coffee and tea following the 10.30 Sunday morning service. And so we're introducing an opportunity to meet via Zoom each Sunday beginning at 11.30 a.m. And that commences this Sunday, the 31st of January. And details of how to join are posted on the Cathedral website and the Facebook page. And please feel free to join us in future weeks, or indeed this week if you're in time and if you're able. We'd be delighted to see you and hear from you. I mentioned at the opening of this service that Tuesday, the 2nd of February, is Candlemas. And normally we would have a Sunday evening service on the Sunday nearest that date, but obviously this year that is not possible. But there will be a short online act of worship for Candlemas posted on the 2nd of February itself. Grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In this familiar feast, Jesus meets us to banish the darkness with his light, God with us. In ancient patterns made new, his spirit is here. Though we are apart, we are united as a family around this table. And as we share once more his gifts of bread and wine, his body and blood, his life and death and resurrection, through which he offers us the good gifts of life in all its fullness and life everlasting. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know our thoughts and our desires, and no secret is hidden from you. By your Holy Spirit, prepare us now, so that we may love and worship you as we ought, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Loving God, we acknowledge that we have sinned and are not worthy to be called your children. But you have drawn near to us in Jesus Christ and lavished your love upon us. Grant us the grace to grasp your forgiveness and so to live as those who are redeemed. Grant us the wisdom to recognise you in the faces of friend and stranger and the purpose of bearing the fruit of the Spirit and the word of life to all we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus was at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is God's new covenant sealed with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, to remember me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. On the evening of his resurrection, the risen Lord walked and talked with his followers, though they did not recognise him. 
When he was at table with them, he took bread, broke it, and began to give it to them, and their eyes were opened. Remembering his life, death, and resurrection, and all that the Lord Jesus has done for us, gladly and with grateful hearts we come and offer our prayers and our thanksgiving. Let us pray. The Lord is here and wherever you are, and his Spirit is with us all. So we lift our hearts to the Lord as we give him our thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death, and so we gladly thank you. And with saints and angels we worship and adore you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hear us, O God, and breathe your spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine, set apart from all ordinary uses to this holy use and mystery. May they become for us your body, healing, renewing, life-giving, and may we be changed too to love and care for your world in your name and as you do. Amen. We break this bread that we may share in the body of Christ. We are one body because we all share in the one bread. The cup which we bless is a sharing in the blood of Christ. His life is in us and we live in him. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, redeemer of the world, grant us your peace. God's holy gifts are given for God's people. Taste and see that the Lord is good. God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us pray. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, help us, O God, to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing hymn 707, Healing River of the Spirit.
but Christ still calls us to service in the world. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Oh.